Okay, welcome to lecture 2.2. We're going to be talking about uh, old versus new definition of theory. Uh, and this is really trying to give you a little bit of insight about how science has changed in the history of science. And when we talk about theory, what do we mean? Um, this is important because I think there's a common use of theory and I think there's a more exacting scientific use. So we have to remember that modern science is really born in the 1500s. Uh, we're coming out of the Middle Ages, and by the 1900, uh, there were a lot of, you could call them scientific theories, floating around, some of which were pretty robust, particularly in the hard sciences, I would say, uh, but some of them not really theories at all, really just guesses, particularly in the so-called soft sciences. Um, by the middle of the 1900s, uh, say about 1950, a lot of these old theories are being re-examined, uh, particularly social science theories, and they're being re-evaluated, and very frequently they're really being dismissed. So one of the things I'd like to focus on in this quick lecture is the difference between theory and hypothesis, because they have different meanings than they really did historically or even how they're used popularly in the United States. Okay. So theory versus hypothesis, how do, we, how do I mean we use them? Okay, so a hypothesis comes first. This is where you come up with an explanation as for an event or condition, and you don't have direct test or proof yet. So you, you, you might be doing an aircraft investigation. You might say, well, my hypothesis is pilot error, because a large majority of airplane crashes are because the pilot made a mistake. You don't have any proof of this. You just have a hypothesis. It might turn out to be true. Your theory might hold water, or it might not. Now, theories are, in fact, supported by data, um, by hypotheses that have been checked and counterchecked and confirmed. We're talking about modern theories. So theories in the scientific sense are not guesses. I want to emphasize that. They are well-developed. They have factual support. They most of the time are reviewed by other scientists and have a strong degree of acceptance inside the community. Now, let's back to some of the older theories. In the 1800s, people began to understand, this is an example, that the brain was responsible for how people acted and thought. Okay, that, that took us a while, surprisingly, but it came true. We also knew, a fact, that brains were inside our skulls. Therefore, some people suggested that you could guess the content of someone's brain how, and, and the expression of it, whether they're a good person, a bad person, a smart person, a stupid person, just by feeling the bumps on their skull. Now, that's a pretty crazy idea. But they developed what they called the theory of phrenology or the science of phrenology. And it really wasn't a science in, or a theory in the scientific sense at all. It was really a hypothesis. It was a guess. And obviously, once we started to study this, the, it completely fell apart. You still see, and I, I had to include an example. Here's an example of uh, a phrenological chart where you can see, oh, okay, this is where um, combativeness is located, and this is where sublimity and ideality and all these crazy ideas that you could feel the bumps of someone's head and know where that part of their brain was. Crazy theory, in modern scientific sense, completely dismissed. Now, sometimes a theory evolves but is misapplied. Very early on with uh, scientists like Mendelssohn, um, we have the really development of genetics that people pass on animals, plants, people pass on traits. But very few understood the genetic, how they were done. And we didn't even really understand the structure of the DNA, the double helix, until the 1960s, Watson and Crick's fundamental work. But many took these early theories of genetics, which really were kind of half-baked hypotheses, and applied them to their own prejudices with horrific results. The extermination camps of Nazi Germany, even the sterilization of the undesirables in North Carolina. I'll show you a slide here in a second. Here's one of our famous uh, highway signs about the eugenics board and that's a little flyer over there about how North Carolina sterilized people and this was really driven by a misapplication of what people thought was science but in fact was nothing of the sort okay 
Um, here are some important theories in criminal justice. So one of the ones I like to emphasize is the theory of fingerprints. Uh, the unique nature of fingerprints is assumed to be a fact by most people when they talk about it, but it's really a theory in the scientific sense. And you can see how robust it is. We've tested this over and over and over again by taking people's fingerprints, and we do not find identical fingerprints. So this hypothesis, you have unique fingerprints, has become a theory. The same application really occurred with DNA. And you can see how it came in. That was more in my lifetime. And I'm, I'm going to assume that something similar will probably happen with some other invention or trait in the future. Now, uh, as we kind of close this up, remember that most criminal justice theories are social science, and they're harder. Um, they're harder to develop from hypotheses because you can't physically experiment on people. So a lot of people see social science theories as soft, not hard. And many Americans dismiss theory as just intellectual, performing in the classic examples of Joe Friday, just the facts. Okay, on that note, we'll close this lecture. As I said, we're going to keep them at five or six minutes each. Hope you enjoyed it.